like to 105 for the public safety meeting to order. Next on the agenda is the uh, acceptance of the minutes. Do we have any additions, deletions, corrections on the minutes? If not, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll make it. Okay. Second. Anyone going to second the approval of the minutes here? I moved it. I can't second it. No. You might have to do it then. I'm not on the committee. <laughs> Dave's on. Dave's on. Oh, Dave's Peter. second. Dave's okay. Post on Instagram so he can't. But the, uh, <laughs> Okay, minutes are, are approved. Next up, uh, probation department staffing request. Yes. Um, I know he's on here. Dan? Am I off mute here? Yep. You're, you're good. All right. Um, since uh, Anthony White retired, uh, we have had uh, to replace his position. Um, the backfill that we'd be seeking uh, due to his retirement would be an entry level probation officer trainee position. Um, and uh, uh, also uh, due to the fact that I moved up, uh, I'd be looking to replace uh, or to promote somebody to the position of uh, probation supervisor. And we have a probation senior position that we uh, have left vacant and has not been promoted due to not being able to have a test. So our request that we sent to personnel was for the um, act fill of a probation officer trainee and uh, the promotion of a um, senior and a supervisor position. Uh, the trainee position, like I said, is entry level. It'd be a year of a trainee position. And then after that, it would, after one year, it would move to a probation officer title. So it would go from a grade 14 to a grade 15. Um, I would, due to the fact that we're in COVID and we're probably not going to have any tests, I'd like to hire a probation officer um, on a provisional basis. And then I would like to uh, hopefully keep that person if we could, if they were reachable. Um, but usually it takes, uh, two to three months to hire a new probation officer with background checks and interview process. We need a uh, separate, separate motion. Matt? So Dan, we're gonna move somebody to have, to take your spot as probation supervisor from that's within. Yeah, yeah, that's what I would like and to then, do. So, and then we bounce down, so there's an opening below that. So you you want to start and backfill. We're basically adding one person because we lost Anthony, and we're doing it sort of a cascading thing here, right? Correct. Okay. So the staffing pattern doesn't change. <laughs> no, it would it would it would right. remain it's the just, same. So it'd be it'd be two backfills. It would be a back. Uh, it would be a backfill of a probation officer, and then moving to. Uh, current employees into the positions of supervisor and senior. We're already paying for their probation officer title. It would be just adding that uh, difference between the PO title and the, and the supervisors and senior. Dan, I'm sorry, Dan, I just wanted to clarify because originally you're looking for a probation officer trainee, right? Yeah. Yep. So, we have two. We had two different emails uh, that um, Betty Stanton sent up to your office. The first one was probation officer trainee. Mm -hmm. The other two were uh, for senior and supervisor. She sent yes. them separate. Yes. One, was, one was an actual body, a person. Yes. And the other two were uh, promotional uh, changes in title. Okay. You were just mentioning probation officer. And that's why I just, I thought I oh, missed something. But it's just the trainee and then the yes. probation officer too which is your senior probation officer, and then the probation officer, um, probation supervisor one. It's those yes. three backfills. Okay, thank you. Dana? Dan, explain to me, since one person left, why this is going to be three people. Yep. You're going to hire one, but two other people are going to raise and grade. Yes. Why wouldn't it be one all the way up? 
Well, okay, so uh, our senior position uh, has been open since we lost somebody uh, in the fall of 19, late fall, almost winter. Um, and when he went to, to parole, we didn't have a list anymore. We wanted to try to get a list. We, we wanted to get a test for the spring of 2020, COVID hit. We didn't get a chance to get the test. Uh, Anthony chose not to hire or, or promote provisionally. So we sat on it and waited. Uh, we were in some discussions with personnel office about when we could possibly get exams. There was really no end in sight at that point all summer. So that position we were kind of waiting on since back then to do, and we sat on it. Um, but because of the retirement of, uh, of Anthony, that created actually a body that was down, an actual probation officer. So that's where our trainee comes from. The fact that I was promoted to director leaves the supervisor position open, which would I would like to backfill from that promotion from within. So really, it, that, that's how it lays out that way. Thank you. Any other questions for Dan? So move it to personnel. Okay, I have a motion to move it to personnel. Do I have a second? Dave? Yep. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor to move it to personnel? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we'll move that to personnel. Anything else, uh, Dan? I, yeah, if I could. Uh, it's, it's not a rock solid, but the, uh, the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services announced that uh, we may be looking at uh, some personnel reimbursement for the 18, 19, and 19, 20, raise the age um, budget that we submitted. We uh, were, were quite a few people that were involved in creating the plans and uh, preliminary uh, discussions told us kind of to do certain things to, to potentially get that reimbursement. And we did, we followed the state's direction on that. And it looks like at least the, um, the, the difference that we, we, we plan it this way with actually the board assisted quite a bit and moving our department from 35 to 40 hours in, in anticipation of raise the age, that change is what the state helped us use as that added expense that raised the age brought onto our county. That's how it was submitted and it was submitted as overtime because at that time it was considered a 1.0 um, overtime, the difference between 35 and 40. And I worked with uh, the treasurer, Al Nolat, to help us get those numbers, to submit solid numbers to the state. It looks right now like everything's good, um, but we uh, every day I say that, they send me back something else that they have questions about or they have some numbers that are inconsistent. So. Our preliminary discussions on that do look promising, and uh, I think uh, everybody did a pretty good job um, working together on that, including the board. I think the board putting things in, in minutes for joint finance and personnel prior to raise the age actually provides documentation for us in case we get audited by DCJS or the Division of the Budget that can show that this was in anticipation of the new legislation change. Um, so I, th I think we're going to look okay for that. We're probably going to need some more assistance and guidance for the 2021 budget because they, they called today already questioning that uh, on our proposal. So I think this is going to be an ongoing thing we deal with every couple months with the state trying to, where they're trying to nickel and dime the money that they had promised years ago. So that that's uh, hopefully some good news, but I think it's going to be something we're fighting with going on uh, forward. <clears throat> Dana? Um, Dan, alternative sentencing does quite a work in this arena. Is there anything in there for them or is this only probation? Yeah, they, they, I was talking to Mike today. He can probably speak a little bit more about that, but his, his reimbursement is separate from ours. So we actually have to submit separately uh, when we do our vouchering. I'd be glad to. Uh, Dana, in uh, 20, 2019, we submitted a uh, reimbursement the amount of $6,600 that was for electronic monitoring and for providing community uh, service to raise the age youth. Um, we, we submit our uh, expenses through DSS. So as Dan mentioned, there are different tabs that we submit through and uh, we're, we're talking about ways of working uh, closer together to identify services for youth and uh, 
Uh, I'm glad that I'm surprised that 2018, 19, we were able to seek reimbursement. So that's, that's, that's a good thing for us. So that's Thank all. You. You're welcome. Any other questions for uh, Dan? Dan, you like to add anything else or? Is that it? Not right now. I'm sure uh, I'll have some more updates next month. Okay. Uh, next up, Mike Gray. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick update as to um, the impact of bail reform and an idea how our office is helping in that regard and is impacted actually. So on a regular year, we handle about 60 cases released under supervision. Um, for 2020, when bail reform kicked in, uh, we in 2020, we supervised 234 clients. Uh, at different levels, some were just required to check in by phone, but some were required to be um, in programs and electronically monitored. And, uh, and the breakout is about 56% of those were for misdemeanor cases and uh, of course 44 were felonies. Um, right now we were able to accommodate that by uh, using the pretrial services coordinator on staff, as well as um, using the ETAS person who's state funded to uh, split those duties and cover courts. Uh, right now we're able to maintain and uh, I'll bring it to your attention if we're not able to do so in the future. So um, it's it's working out and the courts have been uh, great to work with as well as public defender and DA's office. Um, electronic monitoring though, as I mentioned, was being relied on. And last year our daily average population was probably five offenders a day. And in the month of January, we were at um, 18. So there's more of a reliance and that's based on the nature of the offenses and the, some of the issues contributing to uh, the defendants being in the system. But um, overall, um, we're, um, we're covering things and uh, things are working out well. So if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Any questions for Mike? Anything else, Mike? No, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, Mike Mercurio. Yes, I'll be quick. Next up, Mike. Um, we have to file quarterly reports with Indigent Legal Services, and uh, the quarterly reports are all filed. We recently submitted a grant for 100000 a year, um, which I, has been submitted. I don't doubt that it will be approved. We, we have uh, submitted the most recent request for funding through a distribution, and I don't doubt that will be approved. And I'm presently checking all of the ILS Harrell Herring contracts to make sure that um, if we need extensions that, that we're requesting them. Uh, the 2020 revenue which was largely, I'd say over 95% from ILS is $1,514,581. And that again is ILS catching up on a lot of money that has been passed to for um, a handful of budget years. But in any event, the annual funding still is substantial. And um, I think we're in a good place with it. We continue to monitor it and make sure ILS needs whatever they need to um, keep the funding moving. I, they have released tentative state budget numbers. And um, so far, it does not appear that the indigent legal services funding will be cut or will be subject to the 20% cut. Um, that's right now. Again, I think everyone um, at the state level and the defense community is keeping an eye on this. and. Um, We'll know more as the state budget process progresses. Um, we're working a combination of in office and from home. That's all working very well with the cooperation of all of the other agencies and courts involved. Um, I think everybody's working very well together right now under the circumstances. And I would just add one last thing, which is uh, some of you may be familiar with Mr. Paul Boyne. And he is, um, he's back again and being active if you happen to receive email from him. Um, he's a unique litigant 
It has been around for a handful of years and um, he's, it's not uncommon for him to email people um, randomly. So I'm just giving you a heads up on that. What's his name? Paul Boyne. How do you spell that last name? B-O-Y-N-E. I know certain members have certainly heard from him. And he's not, uh, he's, he's no concern. He, it's, um, I'm really just bringing it up to your attention. Um, he reaches out with concerns that seem to have no validity whatsoever. Everything else is going well. And if anybody has any questions or need more information, please let me know. Thank you, Mike. Any other department heads want to speak up? Okay. Uh, just want to, with uh, with other business, just real quick. Um, and I'm here. Uh, had a uh, web call yesterday. It was about the uh, New York State Employer Emergency Plan, where the towns, the villages, and municipalities have to come up with a, uh, a plan for other health emergencies. And uh, I talked to Tim, and there are a few go bys uh, that the towns can use, and uh, they're due to be completed by May 1, April 1. So just as a, as a heads up, if you're looking for any go-bys or any uh, assistance, Tim uh, Tim is there, and uh, I sent him a, a go-by that they uh, Nymir, uh brought up yesterday at the, at the uh, webinar. So that's uh, that's hanging out there for us. Also, uh, Saturday uh, and Sunday, the vaccinations. Just to everybody. Uh, who, who were there from Washington County? It was it was great. I got several eight, nine, ten phone calls talking about how great it was. One uh, senior described it as festive, uh, but for two days my arm wasn't festive; it was a little sore. But uh, I thought it was great. Uh, there was plenty of people there to to move it along, and it was just a, a great exercise. And I'd like to thank everybody who uh, who was there and, and made it such a success that so thank you the uh, <clears throat> next order of business is uh, public hearing I believe the sheriff is going to do his report or is that yeah uh, oh before the public hearing okay part of. I don't know how he's planning on doing it sheriff do you want to do the uh, report now or yeah what I was thinking was um, I'll go through the slides of the PowerPoint um, it's only a hundred pages, so should, we've done it five times. This will be the sixth time. Um, it's taken about an hour. So uh, my thought was, if it if it's okay with with everyone, is to go through the uh, the slides and then uh, anyone you know let anybody in now that's uh, here for the public hearing, go through the slides and at the end have a comment period, uh, taking a comments from the public, and then also. Uh, you know, obviously, if committee members have questions during the uh, presentation, more than happy to answer uh, public safety committee members. Um, and then at the end of the public hearing, discuss anything else with the result of the plan. So I know there are people that um, had messaged me that were logging into the uh, public hearing. So if we could just check to make sure that uh, people could be allowed in at this point. I want to allow them in at this point. We're having a public hearing now. Well, I didn't know if he was doing his slides and then open. Well, the plan the is the, yeah. The plan is the uh, is the PowerPoint. So, um, I'd like to if people are going to uh, join this meeting for the purpose of the public hearing, they need to see the what I'm what I'm uh, the plan that I have. So, okay, that part of the public hearing just. Yeah, you'll have to bring the public hearing the date at a certain or a certain time. You'll have to announce okay. that. Are we, are we starting right off with the public hearing or, or yes. later? But that this is but, the public hearing. The the yeah. PowerPoint is part of the public hearing. Exactly. 
Well, no, a public hearing is to hear from the public. Right. No, but he he's going to show them the PowerPoint and then take the responses. He wants them to... Debbie's see. asking if you want to let the public in to see the PowerPoint, uh, Brian. That's, yes. that's the question. Yes, yeah. yeah, so that's what... That's you want to open the public hearing now. Yes, yeah, that's what I was just saying. Was yeah, he right. wants you to open the public right. hearing. Okay. So we'll... So do you want me to read the legal notice? Yes. yes. All right. That's public hearing concerning Washington County Sheriff's Police Reform and Reinvention Collaborative Plan. Notice is hereby given that the Washington County Sheriff will hold a public hearing on January 26, 2021, immediately following the Public Safety Committee meeting scheduled for 1 p.m. via teleconference to gather public comment on the Washington County Sheriff's Police Reform and Reinvention Collaborative Plan in response to the Governor's Executive Order 203. The proposed plan is available on the county website. Further notice is hereby given that comments for the public hearing will be through Zoom video conference. Anyone wishing to comment will be placed in the waiting room until the public hearing portion of the meeting. Please take further notice that to the extent one does not have access to the internet, comments can be sent to the Washington County Sheriff's Office Law Enforcement Center, 399 Broadway, Fort Edward, New York. The public may view the meeting on the YouTube channel, dated January 13, 2021. So I guess you'll open the public hearing. We'll open the public hearing at uh, 126. And uh, to start the... Uh, yep. Yes. You laugh. See all in. We all in? Is everybody? Mm -hmm. all in. Okay, just uh before the sheriff starts, I'd uh, just like to do a little intro. We started uh, this many months ago. I met with the sheriff, and we started with about 24 slides. And uh, as uh, he met with stakeholders, and the process moved along, and the plan evolved. He's up to over 100 slides now. And uh, the sheriff, uh, when I met with him, viewed this, uh, this exercise as uh, in a positive nature. He didn't look at it in a negative way at all. It was to show how good his department is, how they've improved. And uh, he also had to jump on things because of accreditation and training and a strong belief in community first. And uh, we had a strong foundation to, to start this program as he met with the stakeholders. Also, as plans are made and discussed, uh, those plans are made and discussed and refined, but the real key to any plan is leadership. And you never read that in any of these, the, uh, the books as they go forward. But the, uh, the process means nothing without leadership. Leadership that buys into the plan and ensures the organization is committed to the plan. That is the ultimately the most important thing. You can write a plan, but if there's no commitment to the plan, it doesn't happen. And Sheriff Murphy is the kind of leader who is committed to the plan. Also, elected officials must support the plan, not only in principle, principle, but financially, if the plan requires additional resources. And I believe this has been a very transparent process for the community and stakeholders and a lot of input. And Sheriff, uh, you want to introduce your plan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, appreciate it. And for those uh, in the public that have joined the, the meeting, uh, the, the plan will be to go through uh, the plan and then if you uh, would like, you could take notes or, or whatever. And then at the end of the, uh, the plan, uh, the showing of the slides, you can ask any questions that you'd like. Also, if you're uh, tech savvy enough, you could go to the county website and uh, see the plan yourself, open it on another screen uh, while, while we're going through this. So you can go back and look at any of the uh, slides as we go through them. Okay. So we go to the next slide. Thank you. So this is uh, basically the next two slides are the index. And uh, again, the, this, this uh, just so you know, and members of the committee knows, uh, the way that we went about creating this plan, uh, we'll see in a, in a slide here uh, coming up, um, is that uh, 
we put the plan on the county webpage as it evolved. Uh, we also uh, created a new email address I'll talk about in a minute that allowed people in the public to go and view the plan as it evolved and, and had any questions. So I just wanted to say that before we started. Um, so this slide just explains the executive order, what it is, how it came about, and what we did in response to the, to the plan. Um, and we, as you can see, we reviewed our practices, our current practices. We looked at our training. We realized that we had to do some, some other training. Um, and then we decided that a good idea would be to, to do a survey, which you're all aware of and, and assisted with. And uh, by using the, each of the supervisors to try to get a, a good uh, group of people from one end of the county to the other. And uh, there'll be slides in here related to the survey as well. So we started uh, holding online meetings in November. Uh, this will be the sixth online meeting that the public has been um, able to, to be on, uh, different uh, stakeholders and the public combined. Um, and, and as you can see at the bottom there, the draft plan was available for review as it went along. Uh, okay, well, the next slide. So these are the people that are were either identified as stakeholders early on and uh, according to the executive order, certain people had to be a uh, member. So uh, that's why the group is made up the way it is. And then also uh, members from the community that have participated in uh, power or in the, uh, the slides and the Zoom calls uh, prior. And this is a timeline of, of how uh, the, the uh, plan came about. It actually started in June um, you know, with reviewing the executive order itself and seeing what we had to do. And then in July, you see, we, were, we uh, set up a planning phase. We looked at our training, uh, the same thing in August. And in September, we reviewed all our current policies, all our current training. And then uh, in October, we drafted initial proposals uh, at the public safety meeting. That's where I gave you the uh, document explaining what, how we were going to uh, undertake the plan to uh, comply with the order. In November, we started with stakeholder meetings. We had two uh, Zoom meetings then, and we distributed the public survey in November as well. And then in December, we had three uh, online uh, Zoom calls with the public and stakeholders. And then uh, we also took that time to compile the survey results. Uh, in, in January, uh, now we're in January, we're having the, the public hearing. And then hopefully in February, We'll finalize the plan with any uh, results from either this public hearing or any other information that comes in uh, prior to the Board of Supervisors meeting uh, in February, where hopefully we'll be able to obtain a resolution and then submit the plan to the state. Um, as you know, the plan has to be submitted by April 1st. Um, and there is, a, a, for lack of a better word, <laughs> a threat to uh, the county if, uh, uh, if the plan is not submitted by April 1st, uh, state funding could be withheld. Um, and that's all state funding, not just related to law enforcement, but any state funds at all. And then the governor also included in his 2022 uh, budget proposal, the agencies that don't comply by April 1st will be assigned a monitor that will monitor the progress of the plan and monitor the agency as it results to the plan. So that's why we, uh, you know, we started this process early. We wanted to get ahead of it. We wanted to, to make sure that um, we complied with all the different areas of the plan. It's a, about a 139 page uh, document. So there's a lot to it. Hello? Somebody, uh, somebody had a question? Okay, can go to the next slide. So part of the plan is to, uh, to include your staffing. So this is our organizational chart for two, 2020. That's our current staffing levels. And then to break it down a little further, how it's the administration, patrol, investigations. In this, uh, in this slide, I've included one, one thing that we determined uh, throughout the plan and putting the plan together was we could really use some oversight, some administrative oversight within the office uh, as it results to 
uh, professional standards. And those are uh, things like reviewing officer conduct, uh, good or bad, um, reviewing use of force cases, internal affairs type situations, training, uh, anything related to discovery, which, which you all know about, and then any other operational duties uh, assigned by the sheriff. Uh, we do have a vacant, well, we did have a vacant lieutenant position. We, we made a provisional appointment just within the last week or two. Um, and that is in, that lieutenant's position is going to be the Office of Professional Standards. The one thing by doing that, it kind of creates a void, as you can see, as I have in here, in the uniform patrol side. So we're basically taking that uh, uniform patrol position and making the Office of Professional Standards. So, um, and this is something that could be discussed at the end of the public hearing. But what I'd like to do is request to modify the staffing pattern by adding a deputy so that we could create that uh, patrol lieutenant, a second patrol lieutenant position and then backfill with a deputy sheriff. And again, I can explain that more uh, for timeliness uh, issues at the end of the public hearing. But um, that's, I think that Office of Professional Standards Lieutenant is an extremely important position. It'll help us to uh, make sure that we comply with the, the order and everything that goes along with it. Uh, another uh, part of the, the order is uh, to address how your, your uh, deputies are deployed. So this obviously is a, a map of the county and it's broken up into zones and posts. And that's how we uh, deploy <laughs> patrols. Patrols are basically deployed um, by looking at data, looking at calls for service, and we know uh, where we have to have patrols uh, available for calls. And this is uh, from uh, public safety. This, are, this is the number of calls, that, the phone calls that come in, uh, because another part of the order is you have to determine um, what type of calls you're receiving and how they're coming in. And that breaks down, as you can see, at uh, 15,000, uh, over 15,000 calls, phone calls uh, for the office. Uh, next slide. And this is total uh, PSAP to give you an idea how much uh, public safety uh, does answering the phones over there with uh, hundreds of thousands of calls for service within the county uh, at the 911 center. And then these are calls for service that are broken down by town. Um, in 2019 and 2020. Uh, the little lower in 2020, that was to be expected uh, because of COVID. Um, we do a lot of stuff out of the, the Fort Edward office that obviously, um, you know, it wasn't, we weren't available to do during COVID during a lockdown. Um, so the calls were down a little bit for 2020, but I can assure you that crime, crime wasn't. And then these are, uh, these are crime by type. Uh, this is for 2018, 19, and 20. And then another part is uh, of the order is, is how we respond to uh, once people are arrested and what happens to them. Um, as you know, in 2018, we we're the second county in the state to open a central arraignment park. And really what that did for the, uh, related to the council at first appearance. Um, really what that did is cut our uh, population about in half um, for with the cap court. And um, it, you know, it, it also saved deputies having to bring in troopers and village police departments from transporting people, you know, in the middle of the night to, to find a judge and, and try to get an arraignment. So uh, that's been very helpful uh, as well. So I wanna make sure to include that in our plan. And in fact, uh, the cap court was uh, nominated for an outstanding criminal justice award from a national criminal justice association related to the central arraignment bar. And that's a breakdown of uh, how many people went through the, the cap arraignment and what agencies brought how many. And then another part is determining the role of police. And these are the the, each one of these um, slides in between is language that's out of the police uh, reform and reinvention collaboration. So procedural justice is something that we've been following for, for a long time um, and kind of goes along with our, our community first type uh, initiatives. 
but uh, basically uh, this, as you can see, I got my, my camera in the way here, but um, it's related to President Obama's task force on 21st century policing, where uh, procedural justice and police legitimacy and recognizes the essential role in establishing a positive relationship with the community that our office has embraced. And I say that because of all of our community first initiatives. Uh, our agency mission statement has been upgraded. That's at the, the end of this. And it's more, uh, more of an emphasis on our uh, community relations. And then the four pillars of procedural justice that we follow is give others a voice, exercise neutrality and decision-making, treat others with di dignity and respect and foster a sense of trustworthiness and earn a trust of the community. And uh, that's, you know, it's, it's ironic that all of this uh, has, has come out in the, in the police reform and, and reinvention collaborative, but it's, I'm proud to say that we've actually been doing this uh, since I took office. So in 2012, as many of you know that we're here then, um, we started our community first approach. We put that motto on all our cars, on our stationery, on our letterhead. And it's a constant reminder to all our members that we put the community its needs uh, first and above our own. Uh, we have a large social media presence and following with over 15,000 followers. And we use the social media to connect with the public and enhance our transparency. Uh, the community first approach is modeled after the nine policing principles and the three core ideals of Sir Robert Peel from 1829. And even though that was you know, a long time ago, those methods are actually even more relevant today, I think, than they were then. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but again, this is on the um, on the website for anyone to see. But again, um, for from being from 1829, uh, these uh, principles in the in the core on the next page, uh, uh, core uh, policing ideas are as relevant today as then. And I've since 2012. A lot of times when I do speaking engagements, I'll use these. Uh, these core ideas and, and the policing principles uh, when speaking about community and community uh, relations and the importance of it. And the one thing that um, I always re remind or I always mention is that uh, the one thing that Sir Peel said is that the public are the police and the police are the public and we can't do our job without the public. So uh, we keep that uh, as, as part of our motto. So another thing that we did Along those lines, as a community first initiative, is we created the liaison to town supervisor program. Some of the, the supervisors we have to uh, get some more people that are matched up with the supervisor. But as you know, um, that kind of create creates that line of communication from the citizens uh, to the town supervisors and then to the sheriff's office if uh, they're having any issues uh, within their towns. Um, I think it's been a pretty helpful program and I know a lot of supervisors taking advantage of having a personal liaison. And then uh, as a result of our community first efforts, um, we were actually recognized by the United States Department of Justice for our uh, innovative community policing efforts with an award from the US Attorney General's office. And for me that was confirmation that you know we were doing the right thing and, and again this was uh, you know long before um, uh, police reform came about or, or, or uh, any of the other issues related to that. So we've been on the right track, in other words, and I think that uh, because of that, it's been very helpful for us to comply with this order. And these are a list of our uh, community outreach programs that we have. Um, and and we, do, we do a lot uh, of community outreach. We can't obviously do it so much now with, with COVID, but uh, we've tried to uh, actually do a lot more online things and, and Zoom meetings like this uh, to try to uh, still meet with some of the people that we uh, met with before. Um, the Sheriff Summer Camp is a, is a big part of that uh, for kids 9 to 12 that are from the area that can't afford to go to camp or can't afford to, to do stuff like that. So the Sheriff's Office actually uh, helps to bring the kids out to the Finger Lakes region and they interact with law enforcement in a positive way. In other ways, our explorers post uh, for kids age 14 to 20, interested in law enforcement. Um, 
a lot of the members from this office volunteer their times for this for this uh, Explorers Post as well. And we actually have had um, a cadet go through the Explorers Post, end up taking a deputy sheriff's exam, and we hired him as a full-time deputy. He's been with us a few years now, and uh, we're really proud of that, that program as well. And then uh, another is a prom crash drill. Sergeant Bobby Sullivan uh, goes around to schools uh, every uh, April and and does a presentation on the dangers of impaired driving. And then we have all different types of community outreach through forums. Uh, the fair is a big opportunity for us to, to have community outreach. Um, the home, the heroin uh, awareness community meetings that we've had, opioid epidemic. Uh, we do a lot of senior citizens training uh, for risk of internet and phone scams. And then our Project Lifesavers, a popular program where people who are prone to wander um, are outfitted with a device. And then we have deputies that are trained that can track them. And those are just some pictures from different uh, community events. Uh, accreditation, this is probably the most, uh, one of the most important parts along with training of our response to the executive order. Um, and part of uh, the governor's executive or the budget for next year, I'm sorry, for 2022, I guess it'll be. Um, he's gonna require that agencies are either accredited or their hiring practices are accredited. And I think that's a good thing. I, I would be uh, fully in favor of that. Um, and just the way we broke it down here on the slide, it's a temporary way of helping agencies evaluate and improve their overall performance. And it provides a formal recognition that the organization meets or exceeds general expectations of quality in the field. And it uh, acknowledges that the implementation of policies that are conceptually sound and operationally effective. That started in 1989. As you can see, it's uh, an increase in effectiveness and efficiency of law enforcement agencies utilizing existing personnel, equipment, and facilities to, to the extent possible. And uh, some of the other parts ensure the appropriate training of law enforcement personnel, promote public confidence in law enforcement agencies. It's probably the best thing that ever happened to law enforcement. And I'm proud to say that we've uh, been part of that process uh, for years. Uh, there's standards that are set by the state. There's 110 of them. They cover administration, training, and operations. Uh, we were originally accredited in 2007, and then every five years, uh, you have to be re-evaluated and re-accredited. And the way that works is they send uh, assessors actually to the office for three days. They go through all your records. They talk to different employees. They look at your evidence rooms. They look at your weapon storage. They look at everything. And uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not an easy thing to get, and it's an even more difficult thing to keep. And I think actually that might be on the next slide. Yeah, and I, I'm so, uh, uh, I, I bought into this program a long time ago and I've been an assessor, a team leader assessor for 26 years. So I've, and I've assessed about a hundred agencies across New York State. So uh, you can tell it is something that's very uh, important to me. It is voluntary, but um, a lot of us feel it should be uh, mandatory. And um, I am working with Assemblywoman Warner to introduce legislation that will prioritize access to funding for agencies that are accredited as an incentive for agencies to become accredited. Uh, and as I stated earlier, um, the, the, the governor uh, has hinted that uh, in the 2022 budget, uh, accreditation is going to be a requirement one, in one respect or the other. Training is the other very important part of, of the uh, reform and it, as it should be. And I'm proud to say that our agency uh, is, does a, a more, than, more training than most agencies. Let's put it that way. Um, you know, we, we really have to make sure that our members are properly trained. And if you are an accredited agency, you have to have at a minimum 21 hours per deputy annually. Um, some of those topics are supervisory training, firearms, use of force, and uh, use of deadly physical force. Uh, we encourage our, our deputies to look for training conferences, look for different training throughout the state or the country for that matter. 
and we will uh, we'll send everyone to any class we can. Um, and as you can see, I broke down uh, starting in 2017, the number of hours um, as a department that we spent on training. And as part of the, the reform uh, back early on in July, um, the July, August uh, timeframe, um, we saw, you know, what the different types of training were going to be required. So we did the uh, de-escalation and communications training uh, that was in August. And, um, you know, we, as I put in the, in the slides, we, res we, we recognize that this training provides deputies with an organized way to make decisions about how they will act in given situation to prevent escalation and resolve conflict. It teaches self-control, effective communication, scene assessment and management, and force options. And what we actually did was um, we did role playing, and the uh, members took it all took it very seriously. We videoed that through our body camera system for training purposes, and it taught uh, deputies again, as of this state, uh, this state's here, um, how to de-escalate stressful situations including where you have to use force or where you shouldn't use force. And then another part um, that was going to be required in the executive order is anti-bias policing training. So we did that uh, as well in June, uh, as soon as the executive order came out. And we're going to require that that be a annual uh, mandatory training requirement. So we'll do the, uh, the anti-bias policing training uh, every year. And as we said on this slide here, that members of the public must feel that the police in their area are acting and reacting in a fair and impartial manner, regardless of the public's race, age, gender, socioeconomic status. For the BDAT Trust, deputies must exhibit fairness during each encounter with members of the public. And this training represents just a start of a more unbiased way of thinking, reacting, and ultimately effectively policing. So as part of the... Uh, the good part about being uh, the president of the Sheriff's Association was we got to pick what our summer training conference training was going to be. So um, we had training in Saratoga, um, and part of that training was from the diversity and equity inclusion. We had Professor Edward Lawson, and he uh, taught an approach to community engagement that assisted individuals and organizations across multiple sectors, creating conditions that increase communication and connection with the public. It was a very uh, good conference, um, and it was very helpful in, in uh, responding to the executive order. And another part of the training was uh, from Dr. Mark Montgomery, and that was uh, about uh, rise together, stand together, positive social change during social unrest. Again, extremely valuable information, and it was uh, also very helpful, as was uh, the film that, the, that we watched, uh, the documentary film by uh, A.J. Ali, uh, that Walking While Black, was, all of this was uh, intended to help sheriffs uh, to conform with the plan and, and to help be uh, uh, more in tune with what the executive order uh, was looking to accomplish. And then uh, prior to that, we did some first responder training for people with disability and uh, disability awareness training. This is through Niagara University. We had our whole department go through this training. It was very good training. In fact, um, we're looking at the opportunity now, hopefully, uh, you know, once COVID uh, allows us to do so, is to have some of our members trained so that they can uh, provide this training as well. Uh, it's, train, it's called Train a Trainer. So we wanna have people within our office that can, can do this. It was very good training. And that's for people with disabilities, whether it's autism or, or the like. And then another big area uh, is mental health and substance abuse. So uh, we had training with a focus on emotionally disturbed persons. You know, we get those calls uh, frequently in the county. So we wanna make sure that deputies are trained with the, with the latest uh, tools and be able to handle that, um, as well as substitute or substance abuse and people with autism. Uh, and that was provided through the Justice Center. All uh, uniform members received that training and, and also uh, been a, were equipped uh, for years now with the, the training and the use of Narcan. And in September, 
we did uh, crisis intervention team training through the law enforcement assistance program. And uh, we have members who are, are specially trained in post-critical incident training to deal with those uh, involved in traumatic events. And this is a breakdown of the first responder uh, disability awareness training that I was speaking about. And one of the things that came out um, through my discussions with Assemblyman Warner, Warner was to um, possibly identify uh, through our uh, records management and CAD system uh, ways that we could identify houses uh, where people live uh, that have disabilities so that we could flap those addresses and, and be aware of that. So that was a, a great idea that came as a result of, uh, of talking through this plan. And these are a list of topics that, um, training topics that we've done and do and will continue to do. Um, and these are just ones that are kind of related to the plan. They're not the whole list. Um, and as I put on the, uh, on the slide here, we, it's a 15 page list of the different types of training topics that we do. So, um, like I said, we, we know that training is a very important part. And that's uh, for those that haven't been able to see our training facility. Uh, we did do have a state of state of the art training facility in back when we could have a, a number of people in there. Uh, we use that at least three times a month, if not more, uh, for training and uh, we'll continue to do so once we're allowed to. And then the policy development's important part and that's where um, Again, that position of uh, the Office of Professional Standards will, will be handy um, because the policy is, is a very important part of, of the agency. And especially when you're accredited because you have to uh, update your policy and make sure that it uh, meets the standards uh, annually. And one way we do that, um, that we track that is uh, through NIMR, uh, all deputies, all members, can, when we change a policy, update a policy, or add or, or delete a policy, you uh, sign on to NIMERS and you're actually uh, required to read the policy and then uh, sign an agreement that you uh, received it and understand the training or the, or the policy. So it's a very good system. Use of force obviously is a big part of the uh, police reform. So we do, we do training annually on use of force anyways. Um, we've updated our use of force policy pursuant to uh, what was required in 2000, 2019. Uh, some of the changes uh, were related to uh, definitions and guidelines. Uh, we also have to report use of force to uh, New York State DCGS through a portal system. Um, and there'll be a slide coming up uh, that allows for data, data tracking. And again, the Office of Professional Standards is something that would oversee all the use of force and we'd be able to uh, track that easier. Um, we don't have a lot, thankfully, of use of force. Uh, but when we do, we like to use it, again, as training uh, experiences as well. So parts that were updated are duty to intervene, and that's a, any officer present uh, observing another officer using force that he or she reasonably believes to be clearly beyond the objectable reasonable under the circumstances shall intercede to prevent the use of unreasonable force. And then uh, also uh, if it exceeds the degree of force as described in our policy that has to be promptly reported in uh, those observations to a supervisor. So our, our use of force policy covers all of the areas of concern in the executive order. Um, it clearly states that the use of indiscriminate force is, is prohibited. And as an outlined, unnecessary force occurs when unjustified physical abuse of a person has occurred or when it's apparent the type of degree of force employed was neither necessary, appropriate, or objectively reasonable under the circumstances or when any degree of force is utilized as summary punishment or vengeance. So uh, our less lethal options include uh, verbal, open hands, pepper spray, taser, and 40 
millimeter impact projectiles. So as part of our reporting, uh, in July was when it had to be recorded to the state. And then uh, we've had a total of 13 incidents uh, over 19 and 20. Um, four of those wouldn't have to be reported now because they changed the wording in how the uh, use of force has to be reported. Prior to uh, October of 2020, if a deputy, uh, for instance, even if he removed his firearm uh, from his holster, didn't point it at anybody, just unholstered it, or did the same unholstered taser, uh, that would have had to been reported. They changed that on October 20th. Uh, so now it's if uh, if a deputy points a taser or, or points a handgun or activates a taser or uses a handgun. So those are the uh, incidents that we've tracked that are on file um, and then in the middle of the incident types of what they were. So it was all related to an arrest or domestic violence calls, unfortunately, or they're very dangerous for everyone involved, including the officers. And that's why uh, most of the time that's where your uh, use of force are going to come. But we only had two out of all those. We had two uh, taser activations. The rest were either just unholstering or pointing the taser. Body-worn cameras, um, this is another thing that the governor has made, is going to make mandatory uh, for all law enforcement agencies. Thankfully, we've had body-worn cameras for years, and even more thankfully, and, and thank you to the board for uh, allowing us to upgrade our system, um, basically because of the discovery requirements. But the system that we have now is, is, is a state-of-the-art system, and uh, it, it really is the it sets the standard for uh, body worn camera systems um, and the reason uh, what the our policy outlines as, as we say on here the proper utilization of body worn cameras and requirements for recording of civilians victims witnesses suspects violators as well as the custody and control of such recordings um, and as i stated we upgraded in 2019 and it's been very helpful as far as the discovery laws go. Uh, so this, uh, our policy uh, meets all the requirements within the order. Um, members are required to record incidents until it's reached a conclusion. Uh, the body worn software uh, auto tags videos with a case number and a call type. Uh, so it doesn't require something that the deputy to do something. Uh, videos are automatically uploaded to a cloud server when the body worn camera is docked. So the videos can't be deleted, they can't be altered or anything. Uh, once a deputy puts it in the docking station, it automatically uh, uploads it to a cloud server. Um, these, these body worn cameras also have an automatic record setting. It starts the recording when the vehicle emergency lights are activated or if a taser is activated. And when a deputy draws his or her uh, weapon, sidearm during a, a, or via a holster device that's, that's uh, on the holster, or if the camera detects a gunshot. So any of those things will activate the camera automatically. Uh, the cameras will also be automatically turned on if uh, the deputy is within 30 feet of another deputy that has his camera on. So it takes the the onus off from the deputy to have to uh, remember to press the button uh, to turn the camera on, especially in an emergency life or death situation. Our command staff routinely reviews videos and we, to ensure compliance and with the policy and as an audit to verify officer performance and professionalism. Um, statistics for one year are, uh, we have almost 17,000 videos just in a year. Um, and that's about 22 videos a day that are uploaded. School resource officers, another area of the, the executive order. Um, as you know, in 2018, we worked with the superintendents across the county. We developed a school resource officer program. Um, the key points are, the, are that we, uh, our school resource officers refrain completely from functioning as a school disciplinarian um, if anything happens in a school where when the officer's there, 
um, he has to call another deputy to come in to, to handle the situation if there's going to be any discipline. Uh, the SRO is not to be involved in the enforcement of disciplinary actions or infractions that do not constitute violations of the law. And if you follow the school's therapeutic crisis intervention policy, uh, they're also trained the same way that the school staff is trained on restraining students and do so only in imminent threat that the student is at risk to harm themselves or a threat to harm others. Uh, we were very careful about the, the resource officers that we chose and that we train. We have a great relationship with the school districts and I'm very happy that we, uh, that we started that program. The goal behind it is to build and promote a trusting relationship by developing lines of communications with students and staff and to help promote positive behavior and interaction between the students. And we also, uh, we also like to have them develop expertise in presenting on subjects such as drug and alcohol abuse, prevention, education, social media, peer mediation, conflict resolution. And they provide the presentations at the request of the school personnel and they also work with guidance counselors and other staff to assist students and provide services to students involved in situations where referral to service agencies are necessary, such as DSS, for instance. Uh, so the SROs uh, became familiar with all community agencies that offer support and services to students and their families, such as mental health clinics, drug treatment centers, et cetera. So we want to build and promote a trusting relationship by developing lines of communication with student and staff and provide positive behavior and interaction between the students. So we currently contract with Argyle, Greenwich, Hartford, Hudson Falls, and Whitehall school districts. Those are some photos from some of the schools. Demographics are part of the uh, reform as well. So the studies using available search criteria in our current agency systems, we conducted those. We looked at um, patterns of inequity or arrest in police contacts and find any racial gender identity bias. Um, and then the next slide shows the four years of arrest data from the sheriff's office. And as you can see, it breaks down by age, or I'm sorry, by race and sex, and also it has juvenile arrests on there. And that's from 2017 to 2020. And then vehicle and traffic, uh, we looked at that as well uh, as, rela as it relates to race and ethnicity. And as you can see, each year is broken down um, by how many uh, total vehicle traffic tickets were written and then uh, what the race and ethnicity of those uh, people were. Recruitment's a big area for us as well. Um, and as you know, the, the exams are given annually and the county personnel office develops a list based on scoring. And then we must choose from the three top candidates. Um, we assign a, a, a criminal investigator to that candidate and they complete a full background investigation, including personal references, financial employment history. And we also review their social media accounts uh, candidates must also pass physical fitness, medical, and psychological exams. Um, I've been part of a move to try to change the current top three requirement uh, to a pass-fail system. I don't think civil service is ever going to do that. But we just met recently, within the last week, with uh, civil, state civil service and asked if we could expand the band that they, uh, they use currently is five points. So 95 to 100, 90 to 95 and such. Um, but what happens is, is you'll end up with the same people uh, at the top of the list. And if they're not good candidates, um, you can't ever get to anyone below them. So uh, if we expanded the band, it would help us to hire a more diverse uh, workplace or workforce for sure. Um, and then I just put in there that we, in 2018 with the board's approval, uh, we removed the residency requirement um, it used to be that you had to live uh, in Washington County. So we opened it up to uh, applicants from contiguous counties, which allowed us for a larger pool of candidates and then in turn hiring a more uh, diverse workforce. 
Uh, these are the Washington County uh, population demographics. Of course, there are uh, estimates until the latest census uh, comes in. And then uh, law enforcement assisted diversion programs. Um, we've had a long uh, time partnership with the district attorney and alternative sentencing council for prevention, center for recovery for uh, different uh, diversion programs. And uh, a few years back, we received a grant and then we worked um, with uh, the council for prevention and center for recovery. And um, we're, we're actually, uh, we just met my, myself, the district attorney and Mike Ray uh, just met. And uh, we'd like to uh, expand our diversion program uh, as, as soon as next month, which we'll be bringing to committee with, with more details, but um, for to include juveniles and adults um, and the way that would work is that, um, you know, first we would train deputies on, on uh, what to look for on, on the next slide here. Um, there's certain, certain cases where these will only be cases where there's low level crimes um, and for, or first time offenders. So we would refer that person to alternative sentencing for a risk assessment uh, to identify individual needs, including treatment. Uh, we're going to train deputies to recognize those individuals who meet the requirements and the, the deputies will be authorized to make a referral in lieu of a criminal arrest. So it might be a case where as a first time offender or low level uh, charges where we can work with alternative sentencing um, as an alternative to arresting that person. So we'll have more information on that uh, to come and we hope that that will become a countywide uh, option for law enforcement as an alternative to incarceration. Reporting police misconduct. Um, agencies must have a transparent complaint uh, disposition procedure. So we have a policy, we've had a policy in place uh, prior to this uh, for personnel complaints. Um, we also added a new, as part of our response to the plan, we added a new section on our webpage for compliments or complaints. And that e it's an email that's automatically sent to command staff when someone reports either one of those. Uh, we created a new email address as well, a contact sheriff at washingtonnny.gov. And uh, people could use that to submit uh, compliments or praise. And they also could use that as we, we publicized uh, from the beginning of this uh, plan that people could follow the evolution of the plan, so to speak, and be able to comment on, on different things. And there's a screenshot of that, uh, the county website. Uh, this this is a part of the requirements from the uh, plan is a crime prevention through environmental design. It's more of an urban uh, type issue. Uh, some of the things that we do here is uh, we do property checks throughout the county. Our canine units uh, provide proactive canine sweeps whenever they're requested. Uh, the school resource officers fit into this uh, category and then uh, like our mobile speed trailers that you're familiar with that we'll put out for different locations where we have problem with speeding vehicles. That's any hate crimes. So we've had a policy in place and uh, designed to assist employees in identifying investigating hate crimes and assisting victimized individuals and communities. Um, fortunately, uh, we don't have uh, that problem. Um, we have hate crime incident data that's available 2014 to 2018 uh, indicates that we had one incident from 2014 and then uh, no other incidents uh, reports for those other remaining years. In this uh, problem oriented hotspot policing again, this is uh, I think part my interpretation of this from the governor's executive order is more geared towards an urban setting, but we use directed patrols uh, related to this uh, for um, if we see a trend in burglaries or larcenies, that type of thing. And we also work with uh, other agencies in the area for the same. Um, and then other examples of that would be like the Log Bay Day, uh, Eagleville details where we have large parties or problems with people that are gathering, having, you know, drinking and things like that. Another part of the executive order requires uh, officer wellness. So we've had several members that are trained in peer counseling and they assist uh, other members with traumatic events. Uh, they're also especially trained to recognize the stress levels and symptoms of fellow officers. 
before they become unmanageable. And they provide critical incident stress debriefings to our agency and are available to other agencies as well. Um, we, we actually, we have uh, people that are trained that work with fire departments and um, rescue squads and schools and, and uh, any, other, any other people involved in traumatic events. And we certainly recognize the importance of officer well-being and having members available to assist in those times. So another way that we uh, engaged the public was through the survey. So in addition to the Zoom calls and, and, and today's public hearing, uh, we provided residents with a written survey. That was back in November. And we used each of the 17 town supervisors, as I said. Um, you know, we felt that that would give us more countywide input. Um, we uh, made those surveys available at town halls. Uh, they could pick them up at the sheriff's office headquarters, the satellite station, or in Salem, or they could download uh, those and print them off themselves, which is what some people did. And then uh, people could return those surveys back to their town halls, to the sheriff's office, or they could be faxed or emailed as we did with some of the um, initially, we requested that those surveys be returned by December 4th, but we extended that date and we collected surveys throughout uh, December. We ended up with a total of 155 responses, and that breaks down uh, how many responses came from each. Group. And then these, um, these are the results of the survey. So uh, the top five services ended up being. Um, Responding to uh, criminal investigations, routine patrols, community policing, and special patrols such as DWI seatbelt enforcement. And then the first question was uh, deputies are necessary, sheriff's deputies are necessary part of the community. So, as you can see, uh, the results there strongly agree. And then uh, the next one was accreditation. You can see uh, how that how that broke down the response there as well. If uh, people thought that accreditation was beneficial and the necessity. Uh, or I'm sorry. Next slide. Uh, responsiveness. Sheriff's deputies in our county are responsive to the public needs. You see the, there's um, positive responses there. And then um, if people thought that we did enough training and if the deputies were well-trained and then accountability, if uh, people thought that um, the deputies are accountable for their actions and then the community impact, if, uh, if we strive to have a positive impact in our community. Thankfully, uh, the results for all the questions were were positive. Um, we, we did get uh, a fair amount of I'm not sure's. Um, but the important ones like community policing, as you can see, people, most people agree that that's and strongly agree that that's uh, we, we use a community effective community uh, policing strategy. And uh, with our deployment. Sheriff's deputies are fundamentally honest. Uh, officer complaints, if, if people think that um, they're confident that it will be reviewed objectively. And then obviously we have questions that relate to uh, some of the concerns within the executive order, a pretty generalized question. So it's difficult, I'm sure, but uh, the, if there's corruption within the office, thankfully, uh, no one strongly agreed with that. Um, and then bias. Uh, we had a few agree, strongly agree. A few were neutral, but most uh, disagreed or strongly disagreed that there was bias. Uh, body cameras, you see people overwhelmingly agree that those are important. Recruitment. And then uh, we asked people um, if they had called 911, what they had called, 
or who they had called for. And you see police and EMS were pretty close. And then we asked, I thought it was important to know uh, how often the people that took the survey um, or, or when uh, the last time they dealt with us was. And uh, most were less than five years ago. And then we asked what they were, what that was related to, uh, patrol, investigation, civil, jail, or other. And then we just asked a basic uh, satisfaction on a scale of one to 10. And you can see the results there. Thankfully, they're, they're higher towards the higher numbers. So then we asked uh, what the top three things were uh, to improve policing in the community. Uh, and then it went from 35 for more deputies, 18 more visibility, 17 more patrols. And then we broke down uh, who the people, what the uh, gender and race and age and income of the people that responded to the, to the uh, survey. And then the last thing um, is uh, as part of the order, I revised our mission statement because I wanted to emphasize our, you know, we've always had a mission statement, but I wanna emphasize our, our commitment to the community. So basically our new mission statement will say that members of the West, Washington County Sheriff's Office are committed to providing outstanding professional law enforcement services to the community by enforcing laws, maintaining order, protecting the lives, property and rights of all citizens under the constitution it is our mission to partner with members of our community to collaboratively address issues and improve public safety in a manner that is fair, impartial, transparent, and consistent. So that is our 100 page uh, plan. And I think uh, if it's the proper time to, to see if uh, there are questions from the public or from the committee. Questions from the public? I guess raise your hand and we can unmute you. I can't see. Anyone have a comment to make? Public comment? I think we have uh, Jay. Jay Blanca. Okay. Okay. Can we unmute Jay? Let me unmute my. I'm unmuted. Uh, thank you for doing this, Sheriff. I really appreciate it. Uh, input. Uh, one, a couple of things that kind of I felt were a little glossed over, and I was trying to write notes, but I couldn't write them fast enough. That, and myself included, when I filled out the survey, I couldn't make a statement whether we felt. I, I think for the corruption, I can't remember, but the accountability and that if a complaint would be uh, judiciously taken care of, um, I think with a whole lot of those not sures, we just aren't sure because there's been no reporting of that. Uh, there's no way to look if there was a complaint and how that was adjudicated. So I think with those uh, survey questions where there are a high number of unsures, that that should be looked into why people were unsure that they could respond or didn't know enough. So that's basically my comment. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to comment. And uh, I think you're doing a good job. I just think there's always room for improvement, no matter how good a job anybody's doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Anyone else would like to comment? Uh, Alan Stern. Alan Stern. Go ahead, Alan, unmute. There, there we go. Okay. Uh, hi, Jeff. Um, I was um, very pleased to be involved earlier with a, with a couple of meetings. And, and once again, as Jay said, we certainly do appreciate you doing, doing all this. Uh, mine isn't a quest, uh, comment as much as a question. Um, will you be taking written comments from the, the public between now and the time that you submit this? And if so, uh, you know, what would the timeline be around that? And how do, they, how do people submit it? 
Yeah, I would say you could submit directly in writing to the office um, through mail or email. You have my email address, or you can feel free to give it to anyone. And also that contact sheriff at WashingtonNY.gov if you want to use that, um, they can do that as well. Um, you know, I would hope that uh, our plan will go forward for a resolution uh, in the, at the February Board of Supervisors meeting. So anything that I get prior to that, we certainly can take into consideration and see what uh, people have to say. Great, excellent, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Alan. Anyone else like to comment from the public? Robin? Um, hi, Sheriff. I, I really wanna thank you for providing uh, a lot of the data that we had talked about earlier. Um, it was good to see that on, on the tasers and on the traffic stops. I uh, appreciate you seeking out that information and, and getting it to us. Um, I just had a couple, I think, of, of fairly small questions. The first one is, um, you didn't get any surveys from Hispanic respondents? No, I don't Is that correct? So. Correct. Okay. Um, let me see, I was wondering about, um, you, you have 43, officers and of that 43 one is a black male and three are white females is that correct we got four uh, females i believe okay All right. okay um one thing i was thinking about is i know you have a teen group and i can't remember the name of them i know you you uh, did feature them in your slideshow Explore. but i was I was thinking that that could be um, a place where you could recruit perhaps more females and people of color, you know, from the local community where you aren't so, you know, constrained. I mean, I know that there's a big gap between that and becoming a sheriff, sheriff's officer, but it just might be another way to get people interested in the field. And Sure. Yeah, we, um, we again, you know, prior to COVID, um, the people, the members of my office that assisted with the Explorers Post would go out and look for um, kids, go to different events, and they would um, advertise the fact about, you know, joining the Explorers Post to become a cadet. So uh, certainly it's an opportunity for us to get uh, anybody that's interested, and we welcome anybody that's interested in becoming a cadet. And as I said, you know, we have a good, a good uh story there where we had a, a young man a, when he was a teenager join and now he's uh, graduated, took the test and become a deputy sheriff. Right. Great. Well, thanks so much. And thank you for your help and, and, and with everyone from uh, Allen's group. <laughs> thank you. Michael, Michael Stern. Unmute Michael. Hi, Jeff. Thanks again. Um, is there a way to incorporate the town, village, and state police stats into your surveys or to presentate presentation? Well, the, um, as you know, the town and village um, are required to do their own uh, executive order. So, uh, or, I'm sorry, their own plan uh, in response to the executive order. And, uh, you know, a little bit of a uh, rub with me is that the governor left the state police out of this. So the state police aren't required to uh, have any kind of a plan at all. Uh, so I would say that, you know, the, it's up to the local uh, departments to, uh, with their statistics. Um, really, I was focused on, uh, you know, our agency and what our statistics are. But you could capture them from docs or something, maybe just just to put it into one picture for our whole community. That's that's the question. Is that is that something that you can do or uh, even thought? And then the follow up or last question was: We did a live video training, situational live fire training years ago. Have you been using that for the de-escalation or any of that part? Because that was a that was kind of a phenomenal type of training that you put on. Yeah, that's what we did. We did simunitions, it's called. So it's almost like a pellet um, pistol. Um, that's what we did back in um, August, I think it was, uh, back when we did our de-escalation training. Um, and they the deputies wore protective clothing, and they were put into situations where they either use force or not use force. So, um, 
yes, those are that's very important role playing type type training, and, and uh, we we will continue to do that on an annual basis. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the public? There's one on the chat. Question on chat for the sheriff. Sheriff, can you? Can I think the was, uh, was that regarding uh, Lexa Paul? Let me see. Uh, for affiliation with the term Lexa. Or, no, we don't use uh, Lexa Paul. Um, and if that's in regards to policy creation or or not, I'm not sure. But basically, as I I'm not sure if that's uh, what the question was, Jay. But um, you know, we as I stated during the uh, presentation, we use a NIMER website. We put all our policies on the NIMER website. All our deputies uh, have to log in to review and update. Or when we update or, or uh, uh, put out a new policy, they have to go on and read it and acknowledge a receipt that they read it and understand it. Uh, you don't do any kind of insurance or liability insurance through LexiPol, do you? Does the county? No, it's a NIMER is who are. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks. Yep. You're welcome. I am familiar with LexiPol. Hey, sheriff, we do have a couple of questions that are on the uh, on the YouTube channel as well that I can read to you. Okay. Uh, the first one is from T. Foster, asking if the new position would also oversee trainings, such as implicit bias. Yes. Okay. And uh, the next one was from a Jacqueline Barg. There's a number of questions here. Since results of the survey had a lot of unsure, it would seem to point to the need for public education regarding the Sheriff's Department. Yeah, so the one thing that we did agree with by looking at those statistics is uh, maybe we weren't doing a good enough job selling ourselves. So, um, and actually, um, you know, we, we had been putting out videos to how we do things and uh, more social media things along those nature. And again, this, this position would help um, take away some of the duties from other command staff members so that they would be able to do that. So that is something that, uh, that I also saw from results of the survey. And um, I think we got to do a better job of uh, showing the public all the different things that we do. Uh, next question from Jacqueline was, are there any mental health professionals that are employed by the sheriff's office currently? We have a contract with, um, I can't think of the name of the new company that took over from Lawrence Falls Hospital, but um, the contracts with the jail, uh, but we don't contract with any mental health vendors uh, for the patrol side, if that's the question. And the next one was, uh, I think it was a comment and follow up to that last one, that if not, there should be a mental health professional uh, that accompanies an officer responding to a mental health issue, whether that's an employee of the sheriff's department or an outside uh, firm or organization that works with the sheriff's department. Looks like more a comment than a question. Yep. That's a topic that's come up before. We do, um, we do have members that are on the uh, Community Justice Task Force, and there are um, people available. Uh, one of the groups that comes to mind is ABLE, um, and there's some others that I can't think of their acronyms right now. That is a, an important topic that's come up, and while, you know, we, we uh, certainly would make use of that for sure in a safe way uh, that if we did uh, receive a call from someone who's having an issue a mental health related issue we would love to have the opportunity to have someone who's got mental health training or such as like with the able group that i mentioned uh, to be able to respond and, and help our deputies uh, de-escalate the situation and i think as we go forward there'll be a more of an emphasis on that throughout the law enforcement um, field. So we do, uh, we certainly uh, think that's a good idea. And I think the last question on uh, the YouTube channel is, are there any annual refreshers on bias, disabilities, and mental health responses? Yeah, this is the first year that we've, we've uh, had training related to that. But as I had stated, we, we are going to make those an annual, uh, part of our annual required training. 
All right, that's it uh, as far as what I see for questions on the YouTube. Thanks, Tim. Jeff? Yes, Mike. Yeah, um, I'm a little concerned with what I just heard you say about the police departments that are related to state police. Um, what's the feedback on that? I cannot believe they do not want to participate. Well, I'm not sure, Mike. I know that I don't know that they don't want to participate, but for whatever reason, the governor left them out of the mandate. Uh, it might be because they work for him. I'm not sure, but uh, but um, they're not. The state police are not required to uh, to do what we did to uh, reform, reinvent, collaborate. Uh, not sure why, but you'd have, that's a question for the governor. Um, but yeah, everyone else is scratching their head about that one as well. Wow, I mean, you know, I know a lot of them um, and I know that they were part of it. Yeah, yeah, we have I'm gonna do some, yeah, you've got a great rapport with them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little digging on that. That does not make sense at all. No, it doesn't. And we have a, a great relationship with the state police are very professional uh, organization. Yep. Um, it just, it doesn't make sense that the governor would um, have every other police uh, department, uh, even I, I uh, like state park police, for instance, you know, other state state agencies, but left the state police out of this requirement. Uh, okay. But yeah, that's a good point, Mike. Thank you. Tim, that's a very good point. Sheriff, there was just one more uh, question that just came in on the YouTube channel from Annabelle Gregg that uh, asks if you think the survey accurately represents the county since only 155 out of 60,000 residents responded. Yeah, it's difficult, you know, to uh, get 60,000 people to respond to the survey, obviously. Um, I know other jurisdictions that put surveys out, they got one or two responses. So 155, I think it's not a bad number. I think we, um, we put out 200, I think it was, because we, we figured, um, you know, tried to get at least 10 per town, um, which would give us 170, but we printed out 200 or so. Um, and again, it's, you know, the survey was just part of the uh, plan, it was part of the uh, involvement of the community. Um, my thought was that if people did have bad experiences with with our office and they would go to their town hall and they would get a survey they'd fill it out and tell us they had a bad experience and likewise if uh, someone had a good experience we would hope that they'd want to take part in the survey and, and do that as well so you know you can't make people uh, take the survey i thought that 155 actually in my opinion wasn't a bad response um, again you know i think if um if, if there were major issues and there was, you know, major issues related to some of the questions that are in that survey, people would have easily gone online, downloaded that survey, filled it out and sent it in. So, um, you know, that's, I'm, a, I'm a glass half full guy, but it seems like if a lot of people had problems, they would have reported it through the survey. Thank you. Uh, the public hearing ended a few minutes ago, so. Uh, <laughs> Well, we're, well uh, go ahead, Mike. Mike's got one question. Yeah, okay. Jeff, who, in reference to the State Police Department, um, you know, their bureau, in, how would I refer them to what we are talking about right now? I would suggest contacting the governor's office. The, you know, the governor. Okay, yeah, I have that. You know that. Yep. I would, I would suggest contacting the governor's office um, with that question. It's been a question that's come up you know, throughout the, the state. Um, but yeah, so that, that would be a good thing. Could they have access to this report? 
I mean, I know they can, but where, how? Oh yeah, you mean the um, the actual uh, the presentation? Or, or my my presentation? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on it's on our uh, county webpage. So yep, anybody can uh, okay. there and look at that. To dig deeper than that, what would they do? Um, you mean as far as uh, if they wanted to contact the governor's office? No, I know I know how to do that. Um, for them to get information related to what we're talking about here and now in the resistance that we're hearing coming back from the governor, where would an individual in the departments, the department, go besides this presentation? Um, I'm not sure. I think I think there are some online resources from the state, um, but I'd have to check on that, Mike, and I certainly can, and I can get back with you on that. Yeah, please, if you would. Yeah, no problem. That makes no sense at all. No, I agree. Tom? Yes, uh, well, Brian. Sheriff and Michael, uh, the discussion you're having isn't just really pertinent to what the sheriff's discussion is today. When they did uh, oh, certain things with raise the age, bail reform, and things like that. There's a lot of times they leave off specific groups like the county attorney. <laughs> and you're like, why wouldn't the county attorney be involved? So a lot yeah. of this is done by design, and I don't understand why, but the governor understands why it must be. But we can't put our finger on it either why key groups are always left out that would bring a lot to the table. So I don't think it's just to this one item. I think that's the way he does think sometimes. Okay. I think that should wrap up the public portion. Uh, does the supervisors have any questions uh, for the sheriff on this plan? Thank you, Jeff. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Being that there's uh, no questions, uh, have a resolution to uh, move the sheriff's plan to the full board for our next monthly meeting with any additions or corrections you may have before that based on the public hearing. The motion move that forward. Dave? Move. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Motion. Motion granted to move it forward. Sheriff, any other business? No, I just want to thank everybody. I know it was a long presentation. Thank everybody for uh, for watching. Don? Yes. Uh, now that we've passed the resolution, which I think we should, you could answer some of those uh, questions about the survey and things with a little bit of statistical work. I just calculated it quick. I think you need 60 responses out of that to construct a confidence interval. So it's, uh, statistically, you could do some work on that. It's his first uh, Michael Cern. Michael. No. Michael, you're, this is supervisors now. Public hearing is over. Okay. All right. I was going to ask him a question, but anyway, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. So, so. Um, Sheriff Murphy. Yes. Um, all of that you presented to us today, you know, the backstory is so much has been done already that you've already put into place uh, between the, the trainings and the anti-bias training, the, um, the surveys, um, meeting with community members. I've actually been on a couple of those Zoom, the stakeholders meetings. And I wanna thank you for all your effort. And I think the sheriff that it was, it was good before and now it's better. And so, I want to thank you for all the work you've put into it. And it's a pleasure to have worked through the last six months. Has it been six, seven months? Yeah. So thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Thanks for your help. You're welcome. And Sheriff, again, thank you for your leadership because a plan means nothing without a leader who's going to make the plan uh, come to fruition. So thank you for your hard work. Any other comments before we adjourn? Does he have a personnel request? Oh, Sheriff, uh, Melissa. 
Good afternoon. Yes, I just wanted to mention um, the fact that in the sheriff's plan, there was a request um, to change the staffing pattern to add one lieutenant and one deputy sheriff. So I don't know if we wanted to pull that out and have that to go to personnel in a separate resolution. Sheriff? Yeah, um, yeah. Basically, it's increasing the staffing pattern by one deputy sheriff. Um, you know, I think in the grand scheme of things, with all that's required to meet this uh, police reform for agencies across the state, uh, if that's all that's required from us, we're pretty fortunate. You know, there's uh, a lot of agencies. In other words, are going to have to go through accreditation. Going to have to go through a lot of things that we've already done. Uh, really what this will do will allow us to make sure we have this officer professional standards position as well as a uniform lieutenant position that can work with the road patrol. I, I think that's an important position. I, I did it for eight years uh, with the U.S. Marshals and uh, it's, a, it's an important position. And Sheriff, who would you have the lieutenant report to in the chain of command? Yeah, that we haven't, uh, I haven't really sat down with the command staff now, but it would either be directly to uh, me or the under sheriff, uh, I would think. Um, I think that would probably be the best way to go. I think that's important because when your uh, lieutenant head of uh, professional responsibility can report directly to upper management, it, uh, it, it there's no filter in between what gets to you and the under sheriff. I think that's, that's important in that position. That you hear it straight, straight from the horse's mouth, Matt. Yeah, I'm just trying to think this through on a timing standpoint. Is this is a suggestion that the sheriff's putting in the plan? But we have to approve the plan, and then I would assume <clears throat> the state has to approve the plan. Shouldn't we act on the staffing pattern change sort of after everything's all done? Because I'd hate to do it now and then have somebody change the plan later on. I'm just trying to get from Sheriff Murphy. Is this something we should institute this year? Because it's Brian, from, let me ask you, from a staffing pattern change, those should come through for a budget time more than any place else, shouldn't they? That's what we usually would do. It would be a budget time, yes. So what, what's the critical time frame? Is it sometime this year, Jeff, we should do this? Yeah, I don't think the plan is, uh, you know, it's a, a requirement, obviously, uh, to have this staffing position for the plan to go forward. No, I agree with that. Um, I, honestly, I don't know staffing-wise how long it would take before we could do it anyways. It might be uh, a few months before we had the, the backfill personnel available, for instance. Um, it would depend on a couple different things. Um, it could be as long as six months um, before. Um, and if it's a matter of uh, the cost or what the budget impact is, um, again, that's, I have to calculate that out a little further, but uh, if we take two people out of the union, for instance, they're not going to be making overtime. So uh, that would, there would be no cost, you know, related to that, obviously. Um, so what it would, would come down to is the difference between that and the starting pay for a deputy sheriff. Would it be reasonable to have you meet with the budget officer to kind of vet that out first before we move it forward and act on it in the next 30 days? Or is that... Sure. I, no, I can do. Uh, I can do. In the chat. Yeah, I saw the I saw the chat. Is that, is that okay, Ryan? It's fine with me. Uh, that should work. Um, Tony Jordan had in the chat that this is just uh, it goes for submission, not actually for approval. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, the state doesn't want to take any ownership. They just you have to have a plan. <laughs> you have to have a plan in place. Uh, they're not going to approve a plan or not approve a plan or uh, or anything. It's just uh, the, you just have to have a plan in place. Okay, thank you. Wow. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah. yes. <clears throat> on, on the other hand, uh, an Office of Professional Standards is a pretty important unit, and I'm not sure we ought to wait around for a plan or anything else. I think that's something we should have probably done before. And, uh, you know, I think Don and I both worked in one, so we know what it is. I, I, I think we ought to move that as you know, rapidly as we can, whether it costs some money or not. So move it to person, Ellen. I'll talk to him between now and then. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Bob. So do you guys, 
Did you guys move it to personnel? I don't think that's happened yet. No, you, you just kind of tabled exactly. it for now. But I think it ought to move myself. So, I mean, but you can move it to personnel if you want to. I can't. I'm not on the committee. I think we should wait. But You're vice chair and you could. No, I can't. Oh. Not unless there's not a quorum. Well, there is a. <laughs> well, well, let's see. Uh, yep. We have, we have a quorum. You've got a quorum, so I can't make a motion. Oh, okay. I thought maybe with Dave leaving, didn't. Well, maybe he wasn't out. Okay. We have uh, any just silk? Unmute, so. I'll move it to personnel. Okay. Do I have a second to move it to personnel? Dana Hogan. Dana? Okay. Any discussion? All in favor to move to personnel? Aye. Do we have enough here? Uh, do I have to, uh, do I have to vote yes to, for it to move it to personnel? If you don't, it's not going to go. I, I will, though. I, 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 this is a terrible precedent, even though it's important to do it outside the budget process before we know what's going on, because there's always a one-off while we do it. But I will vote yes so we can move it to personnel to discuss it further. Okay. okay. Opposed? Okay, we'll move it to personnel for further discussion. Brian, you can still meet with the sheriff. Very good. We'll be in touch. We'll be in touch. Sounds good. Any other comments before we adjourn? Break out the snow shovels. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Okay, thanks, Dana. Thanks, Sue. Okay, we are we are adjourned. Thank you very much for a long meeting, but I don't think we beat DPW. <laughs> <laughs>